Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Calls to provide emergency insulin to those who can't afford it can be heard across the state. State policymakers are even calling for a special session to address the problem. Plus, Governor Walls holds a ceremonial bill signing. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. At the close of the 2019 legislative special session, there was a collective sigh of relief that lawmakers and the governor managed to pass the state's new two-year budget. In the wake of that accomplishment, a plan to provide emergency insulin to those who can't afford it did not make it through. Joining me now is physician and Senator Scott Jensen. So glad you could be here today. Thank you, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here. Following the legislative session, you and four of your Republican colleagues colleagues offered a proposal via the opinion page of the Star Tribune that would get insulin to those who need it in an emergency situation. What was your proposal? Basically, we piggybacked on some of the discussions that had taken place. Senator Wickland had dropped a bill in January that I was a co-author on. That did not get a hearing in the Senate HHS committee. So that made it difficult for us to, if you will, get up to speed. Then toward the very end of the session, Senator Benson entertained pulling a piece of that bill onto her omnibus bill in regards to an emergency fill. But the big piece of that bill, the insulin assistance program for emergency situations, that got left behind. It had been supported, but it got left behind. What our editorial said is, okay, in the end we were told by Governor Walls and Senate Majority Le Leader Kaselka and Speaker of the House Hortman that no amendments would be accepted. You put the omnibus bills on the floor, you talk about them, you discuss them, you debate them, you vote them up or down, but no amendments. And so we were told that was what we needed to do. That was problematic for us because we knew there was real aspirational value in that amendment that came up at three in the morning. But we also knew that it had never been sliced and diced, it had never been vetted. And so what we were saying is this can be done. There are good ideas here. But what we need to focus on is eligibility criteria, this bill, whatever we do, has to help the people in need. And the amendment at 3 o'clock in the morning had pushed away some of the people that would need help. We needed to be sustainable. Going and sort of pinging the manufacturer and saying, hey, by the way, you're going to pay the whole bill. That's just asking to end up in court. That's not going to be a sustainable program. And lastly, we need to identify a robust network of pharmacies that would be there at 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon or 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning to give insulin to those people desperate in need of it. So we were saying, we can do this. We should do this. Let's do it now with a bright light shining on it and not let the chaos at the end of the session stop the conversation. So the bill that did pass the House and that was the amendment the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act would have levied attacks on insulin makers that would have funded this. Do you support that idea in general, or do you think that providing insulin can be funded another way? If we're going to say that we want the people who profit from insulin sales to pay the ticket for the solution, then we cannot go simply to manufacturers because the distributors make money, insurance plans make money, PBMs make money, pharmacies make money. I don't think you can isolate one link in the supply chain and say, too bad for you, you're paying the whole bill. Now, I'm not a big pharma guy. Pharmaceutical companies are making plenty of money. But if we really want to be sustainable and thoughtful, we have this thing called the Healthcare Access Fund. Representative Rod Hamilton put that forward as a potential solution. Every one of the Democrats in the House voted that down. Clearly, we haven't had a chance to identify the common ground, explore it, and from that common ground, build a good bill that does what we want. Save lives for those people who are absolutely dependent on insulin. We've spoken more than once on this program about the problem of skyrocketing drug prices. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, insulin costs have nearly, they nearly tripled from 2002 to 2013. What are the factors that are driving this huge cost increase? I'm sure I'm going to miss a couple of factors, but if I had to speak to three of them, I would say one, the manufacturers of insulin really know how to market. 
they can make a very small incremental change to extend their patent. They can put a TV ad on in the middle of a football game, and all of a sudden you swear that if you just go get that kind of insulin instead of this kind, the world will turn rosy and your A1C measurements will be right where you want them. So pharmaceutical manufacturers do hold some real responsibility. But I think legislators do too, because we've let them run wild. They've been doing this for some time and we haven't done anything until this year. At least we passed this pharmacy benefit manager bill, which is a new chapter of law and says, no, 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 business as usual isn't good enough. You're going to be exposed to the light of day. No more spread pricing, clawback behind a cloak of secrecy. But I think physicians have to own part of this too. We have bought in to the fact that, oh, that insulin there, that isn't as good. We'll, we'll go to the latest and greatest, the more expensive one. There are cheaper insulins available. Physicians aren't getting on the phone. If you call some of the pharmacies and say, is there a generic insulin? Or is there a cheaper insulin? Or is there an insulin in a vial instead of a pen? I mean, the fact of the matter is, Walmart pharmacies have insulin vials with a thousand units in them for sale for 25 to 50 bucks. Now, you might not have a fancy pen. You might have to draw it up in the old fashioned way, but you're alive and it's costing you less than 50 bucks a month. So physicians have to own this as well. And I think, frankly, Physicians have to own a lot of it because we should be working with our patients. It's not enough just to write a script and say, goodbye patient, we'll see you in three months. But are there enough hours in the day for physicians to have that kind of responsibility? Absolutely. It, it, I can do that conversation in one minute with you. I can say, Bill, are you going to be able to get your insulin? Where are you getting it? Is there a hardship here? Because if there is, let's do this. It takes a minute. We can get it done. According to the American Diabetes Association, insulin is a unique medication because there is not an alternative therapy. Because it is life-sustaining, is there a special urgency for affordability for this particular product, drug? Yes, it is a unique drug. There's no question, though, that we have drugs that have similar capabilities. We have incretins, and they function like insulin. But yes, at the end of the day, insulin is a unique biologic molecule. It's a big molecule. It's hard to make exactly. And it is life or death in many situations. So it is unique. But you could say the same thing about some of the more life-saving epileptic drugs, mm -hmm. the EpiPen for the peanut allergy kids, uh, the incredible inhalers we have for people with emphysema and asthma that can be life-sustaining. So I think we start with insulin, but as a physician and as a senator, I'm gonna be pushing to expand that conversation to, what do we do for the other folks too who are dependent on a single life-sustaining medication? Are you concerned at all about the politicization of this issue? I know with the opioid epidemic, there was a faction that really wanted the opioid manufacturers to pay and pay dearly for their part in, in the problem. Is, with an insulin tax, are you, is there a faction that's looking for the same kind of thing when really what's important is just that the people who need these drugs get, the, get them? We're supposed to legislate thoughtfully. We are not a punitive body. That was one of the concerns about the opiate bill is, are we creating a precedent for every time we identify a problem, we try to find some sort of daddy, uh, daddy sugar bucks or whatever you want to say, and say, you're paying the bill for this? That's why I respected so much uh, Senator Rosen's uh, perspective saying, well, if we end up getting a large settlement through this whole opiate thing, then we can back off this pool of dollars we're asking the manufacturers and the distributors to participate in. And that makes sense. We need to be very careful here. If every time we see a problem, we want to find a culprit that we can say, you're responsible, we're not going to be doing our, just, our best work. Quickly before we go, if someone is rationing their insulin or worried about their ability to afford the next uh, dose of medication that they need, what should they do? They should call their doctor, their clinic, and if they can't get through, they should call their pharmacy and say, I've got my insulin from you folks before. I am desperate. My sugars are rising. I have no insulin. Can you help me? Most pharmacies would be saying, yes, we can. And oftentimes, a pharmacist will have a hotline to the physician and will get something done. But for heaven's sakes, don't let your sugars rise to 200 and then 300 and 350. In those situations, you need to be attended by medical professionals. Senator Scott Jensen, thank you. You're welcome.
Last winter, Senator Matt Little organized a roundtable discussion on the skyrocketing cost of insulin. I call this roundtable here uh, today because I believe the cost of insulin is immorally high. I always remind people that um, insulin is not a cure for diabetes. It is our life support. It is simply what keeps me and my younger brother and seven and a half million people in the United States alive. It is not a cure. It is literally what keeps me alive. Without insulin, I am dead. In the United States, we, at the time, we were using insulin pens. It's a little bit different than Quinn's vial. Um, Insulin pens are sold in boxes of five, and uh, we were using Novolog at the time, and a box of five insulin pens cost us $697 at the Walgreens at the corner of Lar Larpenter and Lexington. Um, when we were traveling, we purchased insulin in six different countries, and the price of insulin there varied between $40 and $73 for the same box of five pens. Alex's first visit to the pharmacy in June without insurance was scary. I can imagine how scary it was for Alec to leave that pharmacy without his life-saving insulin. And he left that day because he did not have the $1,300 that the pharmacist was charging him for, for insulin and supplies. From the accounts of those closest to him, we put together a timeline that is as accurate as we can get without Alec here to give us the facts. On June 20th, the last day I saw my son, he stopped by the house with friends. They were heading to Wisconsin to buy fireworks, getting ready for the 4th of July. He visited with us, he paid me his car insurance, he looked well. There was no signs of stress or distress. He informed me that he would be picking up his meds in the next day or two. On June 22nd, Alec went to the pharmacy and left without his medications. We believe he felt he could stretch out his remaining insulin until his payday on June 30th. From his bank account records, I could see that he had approximately $1,000 in the bank on that day. So he was about $300 short. $300 could have saved his life. Alex Smith was a constituent of Senator Melissa Wickland, author of the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act. The bill would create a fund to provide emergency insulin to diabetics struggling to afford it. She joined me recently and I asked her why insulin is so expensive in the United States. Well, I think there's a combination of factors, but it's still really hard to pin down, you know, what is it that, you know, it's not one thing I think that's driving the cost um, increases. I think if you look back to the late 1990s even, um, vials of insulin were uh, much more reasonably priced. And since 2000, um, prices have more than tripled, um, you know, five, six, seven times what they were in the late 90s. Um, even over the last five to 10 years, the prices have, have pretty much doubled. Um, but that's only in the United States. I mean, all other countries, it's not, that's not happening, so it's something unique to our system. Um, I think it's an interrelated problem in the whole industry. It's manufacturers, um, pharmacy benefit managers, health plans, and wholesalers. It's, it's all, um, you know, that process of developing net and list prices um, has really caused the list prices to escalate in a really an unreasonable way. So your bill, uh, a version of it did pass the House during regular session. Mm -hmm. um, during the special session, you offered an amendment to put this emergency insulin supply to make it available for people struggling to afford it in the Health and Human Services omnibus budget bill. Mm -hmm. The amendment was defeated on a very close vote. It was mm -hmm. 34 to 33. Um, wh what's next? Well, I think that we are continuing to explore, you know, whether, how could we make that bill better? I mean, if it gets to it um, in its next session, you know, definitely want to be moving that idea forward. Um, if we could do something in the short term, I mean, there's always discussions about um, special session, but I think that's, you know, that's up to leadership, and I hope to keep working on, you know, making sure that the bill is, um, in the best shape that it could be and it's workable and that we've done all of the research um, to 
to say, you know, yes, this is a strong proposal and we want to see it move forward. Five Republican senators have offered a proposal that was published in the Star Tribune that would create a new billing code to be used by existing pharmacies who currently participate in public programs. They're asking the governor, as you said, to call a special session this fall to put this into law. What are your thoughts on this proposal versus the one that you have? Well, I think it, you know, there, there's not like one solution that's perfect and, and my bill, I, you know, it, it's one possible solution. Um, I'm willing to look at their proposal as well. I think it needs to be put into bill form and um, they need to work with the agencies that would be responsible for implementing it so that we know um, we can really get um, to where it's fleshed out in terms of um, how workable each part is and does it do what they um, are hoping that it does. Um, some of that work that we did on the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act, this session, you know, was working with DHS, working with the Board of Pharmacy and, and to create the language. And so I'd like to see that on any, any other proposal that comes forward. I think that needs to be done as well. One more thing. Uh, House Minority Leader Kurt Doubt said that this proposal, which would add a tax to the insulin makers that would then pay for this uh, mm -hmm. emergency supply, that this way of doing it would just, in general, overall increase the cost of insulin because, you know, it's just shifting the cost mm -hmm. um, rather than reducing the cost. D do you think he has a point? Well, I think the bottom line is we want to get to cost reduction. I mean, we want um, insulin should be affordable to everyone who needs to use it. Um, I think in the short term, though, we need to look at solutions that involve all the parties. And um, to this point, the manufacturers, um, the prices continue to, to rise. Um, they have said that they're doing what they can, but the prices are still rising. And so I think it's it's reasonable to expect that they contribute to this solution. Um, hopefully it's, it's a short-term solution and, and as we work all together with the federal government, with you know, all the stakeholders in the, the process that I described, um, that we work with them and we come up with a better way to manage um, prescription drug prices going forward and insulin prices. Um, if you look at the cost to society of uh, people who are not able to afford their insulin, um, that cost to the state is huge. Um, people who are not able to access it and who are rationing, they have serious health impacts, um, and that continues to be a lifelong impact or as severe as Alex's case, you know, where he, he died. I mean, yeah. it's really, it's a crisis and, and we need to approach it that way. That doesn't mean it's the, the only solution forever, but right now, I think it, it is um, responsible to ask them to contribute to it. Finding a way for something to be done. Senator Wicklin, mm -hmm. I want to thank you. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate your inviting me. This week, Governor Walls held a series of ceremonial signings for a number of bills passed during the 2019 legislative session. The new laws ban certain flame retardant chemicals from being used, provide funds to students left hanging by the sudden closure of Argosy University, create a licensing structure to regulate pharmacy benefit managers, and establish a rare disease advisory council. As a Minnesotan, I want to thank you for, uh, for working together, finding compromise, and moving what got covered a lot is a budget bill. But inside that are all of these important pieces of legislation that impact Minnesotans. Uh, and, and this is a big one. And uh, the advocates who are here and the families who are here, uh, I can't thank you enough. In many cases, it, it is, uh, you're here originally out of unspeakable tragedy. And turning that grief and tragedy into advocacy and action has got us to this point. There are so many names and people and children behind this. And uh, we saw another example just this week in Minnesota with Gabe Grunewald and, and where we have names, whether they are rare diseases or orphan disease or whatever you call it, these are real people that are impacted. And the capacity to say that each and every one of these warrants us looking at it, this is not as simple as an economy of scale.
That is not how we can view it when it comes to people. And if we have the capacity, that's what this piece of legislation does. So to the legislators who made this happen, uh, thank you. Historian Brian Pease describes one of the Capitol's unique features in our occasional series, The People's House. We've been highlighting the design and various aspects of the state capitol, but we haven't spent much time on the architect. And as we stand here next to this bust of Cass Gilbert, tell us who he was. Yeah, he was, uh, of course, the architect that designed this building. He had a huge hand in everything. And so he not only designed the floor plans and all the elements inside, but he designed the furniture. He was a hands-on architect who liked to you know, work with the artists and work on commissioned works of art and ideas and concepts. So his hand is everywhere within this building. And, and he comes from St. Paul. He, he was born in Ohio, moved to St. Paul as a young uh, boy, and then pretty much uh, lived his formative years here. He worked as an apprentice carpenter down in Hastings and then went on to uh, school at MIT for a year and took a grand tour of Europe where he saw all the great buildings of Europe at that time and then uh, came back here and then opened a pretty much a small architectural firm with a partner and they did a lot of residences and buildings in St. Paul before he was given this commission. About his European experiences, Cass Gilbert wrote that what he saw there really shaped, the beauty shaped his aesthetic. He came back to the U.S., worked in New York for a time, but as you said, eventually came back to St. Paul mm -hmm. because he believed that his architectural career would benefit from a smaller market. Is that true? Yeah, I, I think so. He, he always, you know, he worked for McKim, Mead & White, which was the foremost architectural firm in New York City, all pretty much well known throughout the United States at that time. And so I think he always looked in the, to, into the future, maybe getting aligned with them or connected with them or even moving out to New York City, which does happen eventually. But, you know, being from St. Paul, he was able to make connections here. He grew up here. He knew a lot of the people. One of the first buildings he built was a house for his mother. And that was, a, as a young architect, kind of a place to establish himself. And then he was given commissions or got hired to do other projects throughout St. Paul. And then... Uh, what made him important as an architect was he had this vision and these ideas and that's where that European tour really cemented some of the ideas that he incorporates into buildings he later builds as a, as a young architect and as an older architect, a well-established architect known internationally by the time he died in 1934. One scholar I read talked about how Gilbert was so good at politicking about cultivating different artists and engineers and, and other people he needed to create the vision of a project. How does that show up in the state capitol? Well, he, he was a shrewd uh, businessman, and he uh, was a part of the Town and Country Club. He was a part of the Minnesota Club. He was a part of the Minnesota Bowl Club. And other members in, that, in those mem organizations are the business leaders. They're the prominent politicians. They're the movers and shakers of St. Paul. So he's smart enough to know I have to start rubbing elbows with a lot of these important people because that's where the commissions will be coming in the future. So he was, uh, worked with Jim, you know, James J. Hill for some of those projects, and he worked with other well-known, you know, Channing Seabury. You know, he later became a commissioner, but he knew him. He lived a couple houses down from where his mother lived. He uh, knew a lot of the, the business people in downtown St. Paul. He was commissioned to do uh, warehouses for some of those men. And so, yeah, he was a shrewd kind of politician, a mover and shaker, and he was trying to work his way up in the uh, kind of the, the upper levels of St. Paul culture and, and society that way. In getting the state capital contract, he had to coordinate efforts for all kinds of people, engineers, artists. He was really good at, at bringing lots of people together for his vision. How did he go about doing that? Well, once again, it, it, it's kind of his personality. I think he was a hard driving person. Um, he had an artistic flair too. He was a watercolor artist, very accomplished. And so he could kind of in his mind envision what he wanted for this building, especially the state capitol, what he wanted it to appear. And so you're right, he was bringing in uh, great relationships with some of the foremost artists of the time period. 
he was, of course, had to work well with that Board of Capital Commissioners because they're the ones who are actually rubber stamping or saying, go ahead, move forward with this. And so he's building relationships with contractors. And, and of course, any project this size, you're going to butt heads with your general contractors and other vendors because they're maybe not doing the work you want it the way done, the way you want it done, or they're maybe behind. And so when you read through some of the documents and the correspondences, you know, there are some struggles going on, but I think everyone left this project in 1905 understanding that this was one of the great you know, projects that as a team we can accomplish a lot of great things. And, and for instance, you know, he had to persuade the capital commissioners to get more money to put art in the building. Gilbert had already, you know, originally wanted some art throughout the big public spaces, but there was never enough money. There was never really a desire by those commissioners to get that done. So he took them on a junket out east to go to all the new buildings that were being built at this time, the Library of Congress, which was kind of the, the basic kind of floor plan or the, f of the blueprint for this building, for the decoration. And, and those commissioners came back to St. Paul and said, we got to do that same thing here for our state capital. We have to spend the money to make this work and make it a very beautiful building. So he knew you know, where to push, where to pull back, and kind of, kind of have his, his influence is very evident throughout this building by having those good working relationships. And the Minnesota State Capitol then became the launching point for a national career. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, in 1899, uh, he moved from St. Paul with his family to New York City. So as he, when he got the commission for the U.S. Custom House in New York City, in the letter he wrote to his wife, he has a little ship he drew in the corner and it says, our ship has arrived. And so they basically were on our way to, uh, to New York City. And, and so he later went on to build the U.S. Custom House in the early 1900s. He built the Woolworth Building. That was the tallest building in the world until the Chrysler Building came online in the 1920s. And then he, uh, his final large project was the U.S. Supreme Court Building. With architects like Frank Lloyd Wright, you clearly see the design aesthetic in, in any building that they did. But with Cass Gilbert, his is more of an integration of lots of different types of architecture, from the neo-Gothic, like you see in the Woolworth Building, to the Beaux-Arts that you see here in this Capitol Building. Was that a unique trait of Cass Gilbert's to be able to incorporate different elements for different buildings? I think it's kind of the, the time period he was coming up as an architect. You have, you have all these influence of the Richardsonian Romanesque architectures, these big forbidding, big archways of stone. Plus you have the lightweight, kind of the Gothic, you know, triangles and the, the different uh, lighthearted kind of gingerbread type stuff. And Queen Anne, if you look at his house in St. Paul that he built, it's a, a combination of shingles and Queen Anne and it's just a eclectic version of all kinds of different architectural styles incorporated in one building. And so that was, I think, his, his master genius in all of this is he was able to take in whatever project it was, he was able to take traditional elements and make it into a very modern functioning building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.